Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. Mischief Theatre rose to fame ten years ago with its smash hit comedy, The Play That Goes Wrong, and has since created a diverse range of stage and TV shows that have been seen around the world. For 2022, Mischief is returning to Edinburgh with three different shows, ranging from its Mischief movie night, to a new piece featuring a character from Magic Goes Wrong, to a solo show, Charlie Russell Aims to Please, written and performed by the person named in the title, who has been a co-creator and cast member in most of the company's shows so far. I spoke to Charlie the day before the three shows opened, and began by asking her what it's like to be back in Edinburgh for the first proper fringe after the pandemic. It is wonderful being back in Edinburgh. The place holds a lot of really lovely, positive memories for me. We, mischief of... I've been coming to Edinburgh with Mischief off and on since 2009. I think we did about six years in a row with our improv show and various other things. So coming back is, is really special. It feels a little bit like home. You can feel as well on the streets and in the venues a, a really excited, hopeful buzz. Yeah, I've not, I've no idea what it might have been like, you know, last year and the last few years when it was cancelled. But definitely, there feels like a, a really positive atmosphere in the place. You feel it in the air. Yeah, well, that's good after the um, problems of the last couple of years, which have really affected mm. all theatre, but uh, particularly mm. the Fringe couldn't go on at all. Mm. And you're in very close venue so it's to be hopes that people are willing to come back have you seen that with ticket sales that people are willing to book yeah yeah we've been really lucky um the sales are pretty strong and um, so i'm in two of the shows that mischief are doing we have three in total and um mischief movie night has a really large capacity so while sales are good, you know, people can still book and definitely they'll be able to get a chance to see it. And it's a lovely big new venue for the Pleasants called the EICC, which is a little bit further out towards Haymarket. But it's a gorgeous venue is there today. And it's really, really exciting to be part of that for the Pleasants. And then um, I'm in another show called Charlie Russell Aims to Please, <laughs> which, as you might imagine, is is a solo show <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that I'm doing. Um, um, the venue is lovely, but quite a small capacity. So actually the sales for that, well, we're sold out for the first week. So it would be a good idea if anyone was planning to come and see it for them to book ahead of time um just because it's only 55 seats very intimate show yeah and you've you said this well, this is sort of a spiritual home for for mischief because it's where mm. you you first did uh, some of the shows that you're most famous for but you've been to mm. massive venues all over the world so what's it like yeah. now going in front of just 55 people <laughs> Just 55, David. It? <laughs> um, it's actually really exciting. I think for the show that I'm doing, um, Charlie Russell Aims to Please, it is perfect because this is new work. It's actually uh, the first thing that I've written that's ever going to be performed. I think it's the first thing that Mischief have done which hasn't been written by Henry, Henry and John. So it is new. We're, we're breaking new ground and... Um, and also the show involves audience participation. I speak to the audience very, you know, closely and, and directly. And um, so that means that the, the smaller audience really works because yeah, hopefully I'm yeah. going to get to know everyone and make that show special. No show is going to be identical to the one before um, because of the way that it works. And uh, the fact that I'm going to ask the audience exactly what makes them happy and what they like. So, of course, that's going to be different every day, which yeah. means the show will be different. So hopefully it'll feel like a really special experience for our audience and very personal and and real rather than that kind of anonymous thing where you feel far away from the action. And You know, the audience will have a massive impact on my show and I'm excited for that. And back to your roots in improvisation, I suppose. That's right. Yeah, it's really nice to kind of blur the two. So there are elements that are pre-prepared and that's not... Um, that's on purpose and that's not something I'm going to be hiding. I've got yeah. things that are pre-prepared, but the order in which I do them, the manner in which I do them will be affected by the audience. Um, which ones get done? Cause I won't be able to do everything, every show. Um, and then there will be things of course that are completely surprising. The audience will throw things at me. I'm sure that I don't have anything prepared for. So, you know, I get to combine the, uh, the joy and excitement of improvisation with also some things having, 
prepared so I know that hopefully they will be successful and and I love it it's going to keep me on my toes yeah and maybe people should book more than once then if it's a different show every night well they are welcome <laughs> to they are welcome to yeah <laughs> so what's the premise behind it then well the story of of how I sort of came up with it I've been I've been assisted by lots of people but basically we were talking about going to Edinburgh this year um, as, as mischief and the idea was that we would take the improv show and then a couple of other shows and I was thinking to myself, I'd, I'd quite like to do a, a solo show. A friend of mine had suggested it might be a, a good thing for me to tackle next. And then I thought, okay, so what am I going to do? What's the show about? And every time I came up with an idea, uh, every time I had a notion, this other thought, this other voice would come in. Well, what will people think of that? <laughs> well, what will reviewers say about that? What will your friends think? And and I was beset by the idea of what I, what I want people to think of it at the end, how I want them to feel, rather than any particular idea. And I was kind of shocked about how obsessed I was, <laughs> how how beset I was by this by the by needing people to like it, like me, trying to I didn't want the, anyone to leave the show not liking it, and that got in the way of true creativity. Um, and then I thought, oh, that's the show. That's the show is <laughs> yeah. is how my need to be liked and my need to please everyone gets in the way of, of authenticity and creativity. Um, and so that's the sort of premise of the show. So how do you rehearse something like that when it depends so much on an audience? I mean, all comedy depends on audience reaction, doesn't it? Mm. Probably this more than many. <laughs> Well, I've got an incredible director in Katie Ann McDonough. Uh, she's one of my best friends as well, which helps. Um, but basically, we we came up with what what could be suggested. We went through the fringe brochure. We went through all the different categories. There was a day in our development time where she had written every single category of show on a different card, and then I had to pick a card at random, and then improvise how I might do that. Um, so, you know, with, with some things it was all right. And then, and then when I picked out sort of circus, I was like, how on earth would I improvise that? Or, um, how would I improvise dance or how would I improvise this? And so then that, that pointed out the things that, oh, I'd, I would love something prepared if someone shouted out dance, or I'd love something prepared if someone shouted out drag. Um, but then other ones, I was like, oh, actually, no, that might be fun to improvise anyway. And then, of course, one of the options could be improvising. Yeah. Um, and then that's it. We sort of started to narrow down the ones we think are most likely to be picked, the ones that I'm going to have the most fun doing, and starting to prepare little bits, we call them. Charlie's bits. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you, and then every day, Katie Ann would just be like, right, we're, we're doing this bit. Yeah. And now we're doing this bit. So it's like training different muscles rather than actually running the show then, is it? Yeah, I mean, I always talk about this when it comes to improv as well. People say, how do you rehearse improv? Because, you know, oh, it's different every time. But it's like, I think, I mean, I'm no sportswoman. Um, but what I imagine is, you know, the England women's football team, they can't rehearse the match with Germany because they don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. They don't know. But what they can do is practice football. And they can give themselves as many different potential scenarios as possible. And they can prepare some set pieces that they could pull out of their hats. And it's basically the same with my show in that I am preparing myself for what if the audience asks for this and then preparing some set pieces. And with improv, you don't have set pieces, but you just practice making stuff up. Yeah. So we shout random things out to each other. And then we just practice making things up. Then that means that when the show comes along or the match comes along, hopefully the muscles are working and you can respond to what's being suggested. And even improvisation shows, they have a set format and certain games that they do. So to some extent, you can practice those, I suppose, can't you? Yeah, it depends on the show. I know yeah. that um, with our show, with Mischief Movie Night, we're improvising a film. You know, as so we get from the audience um, a suggestion for a genre of film, a location and a title and a couple of other things as well, like, you know, the award that it won. And then we make up that film um, based on their suggestions. So when we rehearse, we tend to rehearse what's called long form improv, which is creating a story over an hour to 40 minutes. 
um, rather than necessarily lots of different games. Whereas a short form show, they would practice the games so that they feel really confident with them. But nothing, of course, is prepared in terms of it's always improvised. Yeah, yeah. No, nothing is scripted, but you you practice making up a movie. Yeah. You practice different genres that could come up. Yeah, I was, I've spoken to it improvised comedy groups before like uh, baby wants candy are, are back improvising oh, wow. a musical and I, I interviewed them once some years ago and they said it would actually be harder to rehearse it than it is to just make it up because you know you don't have to remember so many things mm. you're, just, you're just making it up is that do you feel that as well totally and i remember um i remember years and years ago when showstopper were were well they still do make loads of amazing shows but it was yeah. earlier yeah. on in in their journey and people were accusing them of having prepared it and they said they said exactly that can you imagine how difficult it would have been to try and prepare this and then ask the audience for something and then try and fit it to that it's so much harder than actually just saying yes to the suggestions yes to your brains it's just its own little skill that's all and yeah that's hard but you you get better at it yeah. with time yeah so how do you how do you stick to time with a with the running of a show? Do you have a flashing light like a comedian to tell you when to finish, or or is it mm-hmm. an, in, an instinct, or does somebody wave at you? That's a good question. Um, I know that well for us, what we have is a clock that's right. at the back of the audience facing us, yeah. so everybody can see. Oh, we're at that point, and that's again something you practice. Oh, at the halfway point you want to make sure something massive's happened yeah, yeah. so if you've got to halfway point and nothing big has happened then someone usually runs on and <laughs> it has an explosion and then <laughs> and then you know when you're coming towards the end you do need to start wrapping things up so it's best not to come on with a brand new character and with charlie russell aims to please there is a point in the show where i know i have to start moving on to a different section and so i can see that but it will it'll always be ever so slightly different which is exciting but yeah, we've got control of the show. It won't just go on and on and on forever. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't really in Edinburgh, can you? Because you put everybody else out as well. But, uh. Exactly, you'll be fine. <laughs> when you first auditioned for Lambda, did did you see mm. yourself becoming a clown or did were you seeing yourself as the next Juliet at that time? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. So yeah, I auditioned for Lambda three times and I got in on my third attempt. And absolutely, uh, the first time I went, for an audition I completely screwed it up by doing the most bonkers things that were completely ill suited to me because I thought I needed to show them that I could do funny yeah and it was only the next two times around that I started to focus more on who I might actually play I never did a Juliet speech but absolutely I had in my mind that I was going to go to Lambda and come out being you know really serious actor and uh, work the RSC and be very very serious But it's funny because at school and elsewhere, I'd always gravitated towards comedy. And then when I was at Lambda, the first two years, I kept not being given any comedy roles. And I was like, why aren't they giving me any of the funny ones? I can do those. You know, I'm good at that. But of course, that's the point. I was already good at that. Maybe. Maybe I had a little bit more of a, I was sort of connected to the comedy roles. But they also knew I was rehearsing and performing improv um you know lambda were really supportive of that that we were going up every year to the edinburgh fringe to do improv that we were doing shows around london so i think that was the point they were pushing me pushing me to work towards truth which was a bit of discipline but then when third year came along and you're performing to hopefully you know prospective agents and casting directors then that's where i got given a few roles that allowed me to show off some some comedy skills because they'd you know they'd made me practice the stuff that I wasn't as good at and I wasn't as confident in and that's good training isn't it really you don't yeah, just yeah, do the things yeah. you can already do and it actually then informed the comedy it made me better but you know I definitely thought I was going to leave and and be a very serious actor I don't know why I thought that because I was always doing comedy it's very silly isn't it the ideas we have about ourselves um and it's not that I don't want to do serious stuff even now and I still do I've, I've been in plays and tv things where I've, I've done more serious roles and I'm looking forward to that and actually with Mischief we we had a show called Grown Ups in the West End and and in that my character had a bit more of a serious story arc and had quite a serious dramatic scene at the end it was the 
the antidote to the comedy. And I was really grateful for that opportunity to stretch myself and and um, and play the more serious roles. And there was and there's a serious element to my show, um, Charlie Russell aims to please. So that's really good. I think, if I'm honest, my favourite things, my favourite pieces of work that I see television theatre are funny, 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 until they break your heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's really, I think, my weird niche because I I'm quite good at crying. <laughs> It's hard to get right, though, isn't it? I mean, uh, it can come over as a bit too sentimental as, as, as sometimes in, when they do it in a sitcom. Mm. But when they get it right, like, I don't I don't really know, the uh, the last episode of Blackadder when they went over the, the trenches, something like that is remembered by people for years afterwards if they get it right. But it is hard to get I, right, isn't yeah. it? It is hard to get right. I know, but I think when they do, they are the most beautiful pieces of work I've ever seen, right? Yeah. They really earned it. And actually they do stick with people and they are the most heartbreaking. I think um, there's always this balance to be struck because if you don't base it in enough truth and if you don't fall in love with the characters enough, then the payoff w- won't be there yeah. uh, because we don't care enough. We're not emotionally invested enough. But if you've overplayed the earnestness and the seriousness, then you also haven't turned it anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like with sort of the Ameri- the office, both American and the UK or Blackadder or Dad's Army, you know, all of these things, fab, fab. You fall in love with those comedy characters. So when those serious moments come, you've earned them. Yeah. Um, and that is something I'm really drawn towards. I'm not necessarily succeeding with it, <laughs> but I'm. it's the kind of uh, journey that I'm, that I'm really up for. Yeah. Because comedies, probably back to back to ancient Greece, has been looked down on as a as a, a lesser art form to serious drama or tragedy, isn't it? But uh, comedy's hard, isn't it? And you can say a lot more in comedy. You can get away with a lot more in comedy than you can mm. in serious drama. So, I mean, particularly some of the things that you you've done with uh, with mischief, physical comedy and farce. It's physically hard work, but it, it's mm. also, it's also the, the timing of, of and the delivery of the lines mm. it's all very special skills i think it's hard, i think it's easier to go from comedy to serious than the other way around isn't it well I, i'm going to say yes so that <laughs> um more people cast me in serious <laughs> but um i don't know i mean i i obviously don't know what it's like to play hamlet right but i'll, I'll give it a go uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think yeah there's a sort of there's, there's a lot of skill in physical comedy and farce because you absolutely need to be safe. Yeah, um, yeah. You can get genuinely hurt if you're not careful. But also I think, yeah, people maybe, some people slightly underestimate the, the need for good acting in comedy. Because we've all seen comedy shows where it's all a little bit wacky and it's not just somehow, we don't know why, but something doesn't sit with us. You go, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not loving it. Yeah. And you don't know why. And, it, and I, my theory is, that the per- the performance, the script, whatever it is, hasn't necessarily connected with a grain of truth mm. that you need to connect to it. You know, the best, you've got Charlie Chaplin, absolutely ridiculous, and Buster Keaton, but they have these eyes, they have this performance that is so truthful that it makes it funnier. Yeah, it yeah. actually makes it funnier yeah. that it's it's got this grain of truth. And, and yeah, I think it is quite hard to do it takes a lot of work but you're right you can also then really get to people because they've connected so much and they like you so much and then when it gets emotional it's really strong and you're right there are also of course political comedy or satire which gets to really say outrageous things or do outrageous things yeah because it's got this comedy umbrella yeah, I heard Mel Brooks once say that comedy is his best weapon. You know, he put mm-hmm. spring, springtime for Hitler on uh, on film and on stage, um, mm-hmm. which, you know, you it's through comedy you can get away with that and you're saying something that's very political. Mm-hmm. And what better way, what better way to sort of um, bring a big baddie down but yeah. by laughing at them? Exactly. By yeah, making yeah. them look stupid. Yeah, ridicule. It's quite powerful. Nobody likes to look silly. Yeah. when they are so serious <laughs> so just undercutting them is the best way to undermine them yeah um, i was i was talking to um 
the uh, the team behind the current Les Dawson play that's on in Edinburgh uh, this year. And Les Dawson, the comedian, one of his um, big things was playing the piano really badly. And I was talking to them about doing things badly, which, which is um, what uh, Mischief is famous for. It's a, You actually need to be very good at it to be able to do something badly in an effective way, don't you? You can just do it badly and it's not funny. It's just a mess. But mm. it, takes, it takes quite a lot of skill and, and very careful working out to do something badly mm. in a way that's actually funny, doesn't it? Yeah, I would say. We, we get a lot of uh, comments on with the Goes Wrong show and the play that goes wrong. You know, oh, well, it's all right if it goes wrong, isn't it? <laughs> and it's like, well, there's a problem. There are two problems there. One, if it goes wrong, it means it's gone right. So it's not funny <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, if, that, if that picture doesn't fall and stays up where it is, oh. There was no joke, but also, yeah, if it's, it's quite precise, you want to be in control of how it goes wrong and the reason why it goes wrong. So there's a point to it and it's clear for the audience and a bit like um, I was talking to a friend of mine about stage combat, the best stage combat that you can watch fight sequences are where it's so masterfully done that you as an audience member, you feel relaxed. Yeah. So you get to enjoy the danger. But if it looks genuinely dangerous, the audience doesn't get to enjoy the skill because they're worried for you. Yeah. And so I find with the goes wrong show and, and play that goes wrong, you want to let the audience know subconsciously, Oh, don't worry. We've got this. Yeah. This is all on purpose. So then they can laugh at you. Yeah. But if they're worried for you, they don't laugh. And it's all, it makes the audience feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And it, it's, it's often that it's about letting the audience know you've got it. And also actually, I, I kind of think the same with, um, with emotional things, you know, sometimes you can watch plays where you, you worry for the, for the performer perhaps that, Oh, are they okay? Like, and, and have they dealt with this? Whereas, it's important, I think, that, that it's not therapy for the actor. It, it's yeah. processed already. Yeah. And there's an element to that in Charlie Russell Lane's to Please. And I, it's very important to me that the performance hopefully is, is you know, they know I've got this, but don't worry. I, it's been Charlie Russell here, real Charlie Russell has processed this. This is now art, yeah. not me just unloading something yeah. to the audience. But you can still throw some something at them that makes them gasp, can't you? Oh, absolutely! And you want you want it's, it's the it's the mastery behind it is really yeah. really hard, particularly with comedy. Like you want them to feel oh my goodness and shocked, but be able to laugh, not stress out. <laughs> yeah. But how was it different transferring something like that from stage to TV when you did the Goes Wrong show on television? It was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, we um we were really lucky because we actually did the pizza pan goes wrong on the TV. And that was almost directly the theatre show yeah. straight to TV with a few changes. And then we, with Christmas Carol goes wrong, it's very different. It's very TV. And we learned a lot by doing that. So when we got to the sitcom that goes wrong show, we found that balance of, we still need the peril that there's a live audience and you know that they're there and you don't want it to look too slick because the audience might be like, well, they, would, they could have just reshot that, you know? Yeah, yeah. You want it, that peril of they can't stop. They can't stop and do that again. But at the same time, doing it for TV brings a whole new shelf of jokes that you can use, right? And, and our uh, TV director, Martin Dennis, is incredible. You know, he'd be like, well, actually, there's this that we can do and there's this you can do. And it was really fun. And my character, Sandra, you know, actually I feel like she works better on TV because her jokes rely on her being inappropriately aware of what people think of her <laughs> as a theme. Yes. And so she, rather than looking out lots to everyone, she just gets to look to one person and you get it. Yeah. And I don't have to do too much for you to understand what's going on for her. And I, I love the kind of the gift that doing it for TV bring. Also, Martin's incredible because he is able to, it's always like he's the audience's eye. And so with most sitcoms, you you literally film the joke. Yeah. You put the camera on the joke and you film the joke. But because it goes wrong and you've got that meta element, you need the camera to catch the joke in the background. Right, yeah. Because, because it's gone wrong. It's not intentionally 
the director of the TV show, Chris Bean or whatever, the camera wasn't meant to film it. Yeah. And yeah. so you caught it. And, and and that's where Martin Dennis's skill really, really comes in. He's so brilliant at making sure he's like, well, why would I have caught that joke? I need to make sure there's a reason. So actually we're going to have to change the blocking so that you walk over here so that we can catch the joke in the background. Yeah. Which I think in turn makes it more effective. Yeah. So you had a whole new toy box to play with then to, to come uh, up with things that you would never come up with before. Oh, it's a dream. And there are some tricks that you can do that you wouldn't be able to do in live theatre. And yeah. all, this, all the wig-based comedy that I get when I do the goes wrong. And there's an episode from the first series where we are suspended upside down. And you just couldn't do that live because we weren't allowed to be upside down for more than 90 seconds at a time. Yeah, so we yeah. pre-recorded that without an audience. And we would go upside down, flip, fly up in the air, flip upside down, do 90 seconds of the scene, come back down for a minute, flip back up, you know. And and what a joy because you can't, couldn't do that with a live audience. So yeah. I love, I love doing the TV show. <laughs> so you're involved with two productions in Edinburgh this year. You've got um, the one named after you. Um, <laughs> And uh, you've got the uh, the mystery movie night. What uh, what's the third one? This mind the mind mangler. Mind mangler, member of the tragic circle. <laughs> it is so funny. I was sat in on the tech the other day, and it was really amusing because I don't know if this is normal, but a lot of the venue staff had sort of come in and sat down and were just watching it. I'm sure they were working as well, but it, I think it's just so enticing. It's so funny. Henry Lewis is reprising his role from Magic Goes Wrong, right. um, the mind mangler, as is Jonathan Sayer. And it's sort of a spin-off that revolves around that char- those characters. And it, it's, it's incredible. Magic blows your mind, but it's really a comedy show, yeah. a really silly character comedy show. It's a bit naughtier. You know, it's on at 9.30 in the Pleasance Courtyard. So it's got a little bit of a naughtier element to it, which is also really fun for us to do. And I, I've got to say, like, Jonathan Taylor is probably, you know, my comedy hero. Um, he's been my friend since I was about 18. And and Henry Lewis is just disgustingly funny. Like, he, he has these crazy comedy bones. And it's just a joy to watch them. It's so fun. Like I said, yeah. a bit naughty, but yeah. really, really fun. <laughs> Well, naughty is good for uh, an Edinburgh audience, isn't it? Uh, and at 9.30 at night. Especially, yeah. yeah. And it's been directed by Hannah Sharkey, who's incredible. And you've got Ben Hart, the magician, has been working on it. So the team, the whole team is just really, really strong. Yeah. One thing I've found interesting about Mischief is that they've managed to keep hold of everything. The, the, the company controls all of its uh, its own work and all of its rights and its tickets and mm. and everything. There must have been after it made such a success. There must have been plenty of offers from producers who wanted wanted a a stake in it and wanted to take it uh, take it off you. Well, yeah, I think we've benefited as mischief. We've benefited from the fact that we started on our own. So it's a strange thing. It was always really hard to put work on and try and make things happen, and we had to really slog. I mean, we've benefited from a lot of privilege as well. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, we had to really kind of graft. And then that has meant in turn that, you know, it's very much our product. However, we do work with Kenny Wax Limited. So um, yeah. Kenny Wax and Mischief work together as Mischief Worldwide. So we would be nowhere without Kenny Wax and Mark Bentley. And they have really helped us to take things up a notch. They're the people that came to see the play that goes wrong at the Trafalgar Studios and took it on a UK tour. But I think that's the other thing about it. You know, there might have been offers and that sort of thing from other people. But one of the reasons I think we gravitated towards Kenny and Mark was that they were keen for us to keep it. You know, they were keen for the product to still be ours. They, I believe, feel that it's better with us all involved it's tricky and difficult sometimes there's a lot of voices but you know they see the benefit of it remaining um authentically mischief but they bring so much to us too we benefit from them Mm. their expertise their joy their support so it's been a lovely uh team it's been a really nice partnership and i hope it continues yeah mischief worldwide is now um its own company and it's uh we've got these incredible staff members um who work tirelessly we're not the most conventional company 
<laughs> partly because we sort of had to go around the outside you know the reason the play that goes wrong kind of exists is that is that basically enough of us had graduated drama school and none of us were getting any work using the conventional channels so we thought we'd better put a play on to give us something to do so we've ended up skipping the steps and going around and then joining everyone again at, at a different point in the journey and, and now we're, we've got our old practices but we're, <laughs> yeah. we're learning to, we're learning to play better with others yeah and now after a few years you've got a company with worldwide in the title and employees but but it's great to see that the control is still in the hands of, of the artists rather than money men well yeah although you know our money men are artists yeah, and our exactly. money men and women are kind and supportive so I think we've really lucked out in that way. Mm. Um, and, but yes, exactly. It's so great that we, that we have artistic control and the branding is, is well developed. Yeah. The brand is developed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Since the, um, the goes wrong, you've gone in various different directions with, um, well, you've got three different directions just in, in Edinburgh <laughs> this year, mm-hmm. but, but with magic and grown ups and TV, uh, I'm sure you've got plenty of things that you personally or mischief are doing in the future. Is there anything you can you can talk about? <laughs> yeah, there is one actually. Um, I can't tell you lots of things, but uh, mainly because I don't have much going on after Edinburgh. No, <laughs> but the big exciting thing is um, Henry Shields has written a new play called Good Luck Studio um, on his own, and it's being directed by Henry Lewis, and it's being put on in um, a few venues in the South, including Chelmsford. I should know all of them, but I'm afraid I don't. Chelmsford, Salisbury, I want to say. Um, And Good Luck Studio is a really exciting new play. Again, a little bit darker. It's not goes wrong, but it has farcical elements and it's set in a TV studio. So I think it's maybe inspired by some of our experiences. Can't speak for Henry Shields, but um, I've, I've read the script and I'm really excited and the cast are incredible. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. That um, kicks off in the autumn. So that's really exciting. Okay, back to your shows in Edinburgh. Where and when are they on? Charlie Russell aims to please at 3.15 at the Pleasance Courtyard. Mischief Movie Night at the EICC at 6.30. And Mind Mangler, member of the Tragic Circle, at Pleasance Courtyard at 9.30. And it all opens on the 3rd of August. And I really would recommend booking your ticket because <laughs> sales are lovely and strong and we would hate for people to be disappointed. And we'd love to see as many people there as possible. That was Charlie Russell of Mischief Theatre. The new piece by Henry Shields that she mentioned, Good Luck Studio, will be at Mercury Theatre in Colchester, Salisbury Playhouse and Yvonne Arno Theatre in Guildford between September and November 2022. For more details and tickets for the three Edinburgh shows, go to www.edfringe.com, www.pleasance.co.uk or mischiefedfringe.com. Or for more information about the company and its work in general, see www.mischiefcomedy.com. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.